This is a lecture that I gave on post-operative findings in the skull base when I was at the European Society of Head and Neck Radiology in Malta. The first question to ask is, when are we talking about? Are we talking about early complications of surgery in the immediate post-op period? Or are we talking about late complications that can occur months to years later? The next question we should ask ourselves is where are we talking about? The skull base can mean a lot of different things. We can be talking about the anterior skull base from an expanded endonasal approach, we're talking about the olfactory groove or the frontal sinuses. Are we talking about the central skull base, the temporal bone and clivus? Are we talking about the posterior uh, skull base from Chiari decompression and uh, meningiomas around the foramen magnum? We'll talk about early complications and then talk about late complications. And while we're going, we'll talk about where we are in the skull base, whether we're anterior, central, or posterior skull base. The most frequent complications that we encounter after sur skull base surgery are flap failures, which clinically present as leak, flap necrosis, where the flap loses its blood supply, a hematoma, and uh, there's always going to be a little bit of blood, but we're talking about hematomas that cause mass effect, a stroke, injury to the cranial nerves, and we're really worried about cranial nerve six here, infection that can occur in several different areas intracranially, an arterial injury, a venous thrombosis, and then other failures of containment like pseudomeningoceles or encephaloceles. Pituitary dysfunction, if we are worried about an anterior skull base, and pneumocephalus. There's always a little pneumocephalus, but when do we have to worry about it and how do we follow it? Let's first talk about flap reconstruction. When we are doing skull base surgery, we're making a hole in the skull base, and if we don't repair that hole, the brain falls out. And the flap is how we do this. There's several different types of flaps that we use to cover up the defect. The most common is a nasal septal flap, and it has a pedicle that connects the vascular supply to the native supply. This is a rotational flap. You don't have to transpose the vascular supply, so it's still maintaining its native vascular supply along that pedicle. There are other flaps, like a pericranial flap, which in theory is thicker than the septal flaps, although that's pretty theoretical and may not be useful in practice. The easiest way to tell what kind of flap has been performed on your patient is to read the operative report. Flaps are often accompanied by other tissues within the resection bed, like fat packing, a fat graft is used. We know that that fat is going to reabsorb, but at least in the immediate post-operative period, you're going to see it as a, as a mass. There is often packing material, surgical material that will be removed later, or even an occlusive device, uh, often Foley catheters are used in the nose, to occlude any hemorrhage. Here's an example of a patient with a juvenile nasal angiofibroma. It's a huge tumor, it takes up the entire back of the nasal cavity, and you can see that it's starting to impinge on the middle cranial fossa here. Very large tumor. That same patient uh, postoperatively, and you can see that the tumor has been removed, and all we see is this thin line of enhancement across the area where the tumor used to be adjacent to the skull base. This is the flap. This is a nasal septal flap. It's been peeled off the nasal septum. It has retained a vascular pedicle, and it has been laid over the defect that was made in the skull base in order to close that defect. You can actually follow the pedicle back and see where the vascular supply arose from. Usually it's going to be one of the sphenopalatine arteries. Look at the thickness of the flap here. It has variable thickness. That's all okay. Here we are a little bit higher up, and although some areas of the flap are nice and thin, there are some areas that look really bulky. There's a couple reasons why this may be. They may have folded the flap onto itself so it's multiple thicknesses, or it may simply be that the most distal part of the nasal septal mucosa is thicker uh, the further away you get from the pedicle, and so that may be natural. 
you have to not look at this and think, oh, that's a mass. That is a recurrence of the tumor. It enhances a lot, just like the original tumor did. But this is a normal flap. And following it along, following it back to its pedicle can be helpful in distinguishing it from recurrent tumor. Here's another view, a different patient with an intact uh, flap. You can see this thin line of enhancement coming down and around and covering the defect in, this, in the anterior skull base. That's a normal appearance, a normal postoperative appearance to the flap. We want to see this enhancement. That means the vascular supply is maintained. That is the pedicle itself coming in to meet the flap. And here you can see where the pedicle, in fact, meets up with the flap. So following the pedicle along will help you to distinguish the pedicle itself from a recurrent tumor. Here's another example of a, an, an intact flap. Nice enhancement throughout the flap. Now, this looks a little bit thicker, and so you might be inclined to think that this is a pericranial flap rather than a nasal septal flap. Actually, this happens to be a nasal septal flap, and sometimes they can just be a little concerning. It usually doesn't matter at all, but you can check the operative report if you need to know. Remember that these, uh, that these flaps are often accompanied by additional graft material like this fat graft here. Don't mistake the intrinsic T1 signal of the fat graft for enhancement. This can absolutely look like a mass, but if you go to your unenhanced images and if you use fat suppression on your enhanced images, then you should be able to make that distinction by comparing enhanced and unenhanced images with and without fat suppression. So what happens when the flap fails? Well, there's a couple of different ways that a flap can fail. One way it can fail is by displacing, falling away from where it's supposed to cover. This flap should be covering the, top, the, the defect here at the uh, top of the sphenoid sinus. And unfortunately, the flap has fallen away and there is some debris and hemorrhage that is filled in, um, but it's no longer closing the gap. So displacement of the nasal septal flap. Here's the same patient after repair of that flap. Now you see it is covering the defect more thoroughly uh, in the way that it's supposed to, enhancing all the way across there. So looks a lot better now. Here's another patient with a flap failure. Cisternogram is one way to establish the flap failure. Often these are evident clinically because of a CSF leak, uh, but you can demonstrate that leak and show exactly where the flap is failing by doing a cisternogram. All of the, uh, all the contrast should be here accompanying CSF, and you can see it tracking down behind the fat packing and into the, uh, into the nasopharynx here. Another way that a flap can fail is by necrosing. This is a failure of the vascular supply of the flap. Now, these are rotational flaps, so this is an unusual recurrence, but you've still manipulated the tissue and you can have a loss of arterial flow. These patients usually uh, get symptoms that appear uh, two to four weeks after their surgery. Uh, usually, this is accompanied by a meningitis because the necrotic tissue there can become easily infected when it's exposed to the nasal cavity. What's the key finding here? Where's the enhancement? I'm supposed to have nice enhancement all through this flap. The enhancement is gone. That's the critical finding that this flap has failed. I'm just showing this picture because I really like this picture. It's a coronal view of a patient who had uh, debulking of a meningioma. You can see the flap underneath the remaining bone, and you can see the residual meningioma on the, uh, on the uh, inner surface of the bone. So this looks very symmetric, but it's two different things, meningioma on top, flap on the bottom. Okay, what's our next immediate complication? Let's talk about hematomas. There's always going to be a little bit of blood after a surgery, but if that blood is large enough to cause mass effect, 
on surrounding structures, then that's a hematoma that the surgeon needs to know about. They will often go back immediately, like next day, and decompress the hematoma if it is causing mass effect. Uh, this is a patient who had a meningioma uh, along the tuberculum cella, and in the post-op, you might think, oh, they forgot to take out the meningioma. There's still a big uh, mass, dense mass right there. That's they didn't forget to take it out. It just filled in with blood, and this hematoma is large enough to cause mass effect. They went back in and decompressed it. Our next potential complication is stroke. Now, you all know how to image a stroke. We're going to use diffusion-weighted imaging and look for restricted fusion. Okay, fine. But there are some nuances here. Remember that the small amount of blood we expect along a surgical margin to distort the magnetic field, and that can cause artifactual increase on diffusion-weighted imaging. So don't automatically call stroke along the margin until you've looked at your gradient sequences to see whether there's actually a lot of blood there that might be causing an artifact. Another thing to understand about postoperative strokes is there's always going to be a little bit of dead tissue around the margin if you did a resection of brain tissue. You can't avoid hitting a few arteries. Is that a stroke? Yes, that's a stroke. But we use the euphemism devitalized tissue to try and downplay the importance of that finding. Because to be honest, it is an expected finding to have a little rind of devitalized tissue after a surgery that affects the brain. This is true of glioma resections and all the brain resections. There's always going to be a little bit of postoperative stroke. We expect it. We downplay it in our dictations. Uh, when you are dealing with the posterior fossa uh, from, say, carry decompression, there are additional things to worry about in the setting of a territorial stroke, like herniation, either upward transtentorial herniation or herniation down through the foramen magnum, and, of course, hydrocephalus because of compression of the fourth ventricle. Our next potential complication is an injury to a cranial nerve. Which cranial nerve? Well, it depends on where you did the surgery. If you did an anterior skull-based surgery, then you're going to be worried about injury to the optic nerve, the trigeminal nerve, or the abducens nerve. If you are in the middle cranial fossa, if you're doing temporal bone surgery, then you're worried about 5, 7, and 8. And posterior, you're usually, I mean, anything from 9 to 12, but usually 10 and 12 are the most concerning. If you had to take all of them together, cranial nerve 6 is the most concerning, the most likely to be injured. It has a very long intracranial course as it rises up through Dorello's canal. Um, and so that's the one we worried about the most. Now, notice that the one that is often at most risk is the fifth cranial nerve because it is involved both in anterior and middle skull-based surgeries, but the sixth is most likely to be injured. Unfortunately, there are usually no imaging findings that correlate with these cranial neuropathies. But if you can find a compressive mass like that hematoma, that can be helpful, of course. Why cranial nerve 6? Well, it has a long course. You can see it here emerging between the pons and medulla and running an oblique course towards the clivus. Once it reaches the clivus, it dives into this fibrous sheath called Dorello's canal and runs back up the back of the clivus. Once it reaches the top of the clivus, it swings forward into the cavernous sinus and then from there forward into the orbit. A lot of exposure for that sixth cranial nerve, and that is presumably why it is the most likely to be injured. Our next complication is infection. And infections can, uh, after surgery can occur in all of the different spaces. They can be epidural, it can be subdural, and we call those empyemas, epidural and subdural empyemas. It can be peel, and that's just a leptomeningeal menin uh, meningitis. It can be parenchymal, uh, that is an abscess of the brain, or a cerebritis, depending on how severe it is. Um, and it can involve the CSF spaces. Uh, th this is an example of of a meningitis, but you can see the ventriculitis. Once your meningitis becomes a ventriculitis, 
it is much more severe and you need to make that diagnosis of abnormal signal layering debris. It's pus, pus layering in the ventricles. You need to identify that. You need to be looking carefully just like you would for intraventricular blood. Usually these infections are accompanied by a leak. That's how the infection gets in through the same opening that the CSF is getting out from. This ends part one of the lecture on postoperative findings in the skull base.